but like don't come at me with like yeah yeah you know oh you're the survivor you know you watch out for for your <laughs> shit <laughs> Liking sex too much. Okay. <laughs> I do, I do. I love it. I love it. I like sex a lot. A lot, a lot. Is it too much? Has it been too much? No, it is not too much. For other people, Never. it's too much. For other people, it might be too much. I think it makes them uncomfortable because, like, um, when I talk about sex or when I talk about one night stands or when I do any of that and thinking back to when. I first came out as polyamorous. That was not a good thing. It was like directly linked to my survivorship. Like people have told, have talked about me and said that I can't, I, I can't commit. I, I cannot commit because, um, and I don't trust anybody. And so that's why I can't commit that I can't really lo fully love someone. And, and so they connect my poly life with my survivorship. Because they're like, it makes sense, you know, because you've gone through so much crappy shit. Of course, you're not going to have a real, like, relationship. So it was a, as a result of something, not because it was my, my complete and intentional decision to become polyamorous, um, mm -hmm. to come out as polyamorous and to be who I am because it made sense for me. It feels right. And they just had to make a reasoning for it. So it's like, oh, right. there it is. That's it. Right. That's why you right. can't commit. <laughs> <laughs> those are healthy non-survivors who just haven't experienced trauma and every decision they make is based on their healthiness yeah they're you know, so not, healthy they're, they're so really healthy, healthy. right they're really like healthy. us survivors over here just like broken <laughs> fucked up people and then you know any desire we might have any interest like it wasn't because we actually sat down and we're like oh okay here is like some soul searching <laughs> Here's what works for me. Here's what I want to do with my life. Hmm, what an idea. It's not like I can cut the survivorship out of my life and then be like, oh, what decisions would I have made without it? Just as much as I think it would be ridiculous to say that uh, my survivorship is the reason I have a certain sexual desire or interest, I think mm -hmm. it's as ridiculous to say that it has nothing to do with it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes, yes. It's like, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Sometimes I don't know, and sometimes you right. just don't have to get there. It is, is it healthy? Is right, it healthy? Right. Are you doing something that makes you happy? The desire you have by itself is a problem. It's not yeah. about like you the, being poly by itself, having sex with too many partners, too many partners, mm -hmm. uh, or, or whatever the desire is. Because if you didn't think that by itself was an issue, you wouldn't take issue with the interest in it. Right. To right. then try to justify it based on like, you know, your brokenness. And I also think it's connected to, you know, the heteronormative idea of like love their idea of poly completely contradicts the love narrative, right? People often say uh, uh, the thing about getting older and being alone, uh, just being alone, which to me is kind of funny because most married people that I know are very lonely. Mm -hmm. And as a poly person, I am very fulfilled with the people in my life. Lots of friends and beautiful um, non-sexual connections, sexual mm -hmm. connections. It takes work. It takes work yeah. on yourself. And it's, a, it's constant work to be having healthy relationships of all kinds. 50% of first marriages end in divorce. 60% of second marriages end, end in divorce. 70% of third wow. marriages end in divorce. And not to say wow. that divorce, right. I'm glad that people are getting divorced when they need to. But it's like, the whole society is redefining and rethinking what love and desire and sex and all of that fits together. Yeah. In, it's a very new idea as we want it. So to be taking issue with someone who wants to take a non-monogamous approach to it, it's like, yes, because yeah. serial monogamy is so great. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. It's acceptable, damn it. I don't, I don't want to take issue with that inherently either. If serial right, monogamy right. is what works for you, go for it. Exactly, exactly. Um, Do what makes you happy. So I would question myself and be like, okay, is this me? Is this my body saying no to sex, shutting out sex as a part of 
being stuck in being a survivor and what has happened in the past. And so then I went to Google asexual and like went down that rabbit hole. I'm like, oh my God, it's this thing. 1% of the time I have these comment moments like every couple of years where I'm super mega sexual and I want sex like every day, multiple times a day with multiple partners of mine. Or even sometimes I'm like, you know what? Let me get on Bumble and find somebody new just to have sex with. Like, like it's like that. And like my closest friends and even my mother are like, hey, we're not saying, but you know, mm, is some of this related to your survivorhood? And I'm like, no, it's not. But thank you for asking because you're asking out of love and I'm about to go have some hot sex. I am publicly a bad survivor by how much I want to have sex, how much I want to talk about sex, how central I think sex is to our well-being and to our movement. I'm out as a survivor in every venue I'm in, even like job interviews, right? I, I tell people this is part of my story and part of my strength. So then when I'm visibly sexual, people assume it's because I'm broken somehow or because I'm inappropriate or I don't have good boundaries or I don't know what the fuck, I'm you know, unhealed. Uh, rather than that I have a rad radical relationship to patriarchy and white supremacy and fuck it all to death, I'm going to claim my space as a sexual being despite having violence directed at me from, you know, a young age till, you know, recently. Quote, unquote, too much. Is there some right amount to like sex? It's really great. It's super pleasurable. Like, whatever would be too much. I definitely fall on the side of, you know, I am a good survivor because I like sex. For me, getting to a place in my own healing journey where I could be in the wholeness and fullness of my own body, my own genitals, my own sexual spaces, my own sense of arousal, to the point where it's like, I am, you know, sex positive, sex forward, super allosexual, like all the words <laughs> that would describe it, I am that. And that and, and when I when I say that, it doesn't mean that my survivorship doesn't come up. It's actually me moving towards the places in which my survivorship are actually likely to come up in my sexual relationships, in my intimate relationships, friendships, things like that. That is where my survivor stuff comes up the most yeah and it doesn't mean like and liking sex and being sex positive and all of that so it doesn't mean i have all my shit figured out right like i think there's also that like i don't have any issues like i don't show up with body issues sometimes or i don't show up with pleasure issues i have huge issues in receiving pleasure not shocking earlier on in my healing i found a lot of healing through having sex i had somebody that at the time was a friend i thought who was shaming me and saying that because I was sleeping around a lot that I uh, was behaving like I had daddy issues. Now, to be clear, my father sexually abused me. So like, yeah, I got daddy issues. <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about. And it really hit me because I realized how much he and other people in my life saw sex and wanting sex as like a symptom of what had happened to me, a symptom of my CSA and not as a part of my healing and being alive and being alive in my body. If you're a survivor and you're queer, a lot of people have this idea that being queer is solely about mm -hmm. sex. It's mm -hmm. solely about your desire because obviously you can't fuck to have babies. So therefore you're fucking for pleasure oh my god we're fucking for pleasure <laughs> because those who could make babies never fuck for pleasure no, you know never. they just There's do no it every thing. time to make a baby <laughs> you're already a part of this fucking category that's just uh you know demonized already so what's one step further being bisexual right that's another one that's oh like, yeah yeah uh very specifically oh like you want more than one gender like, yeah. oh my gosh, like you just can't fucking get enough. You just yeah, bisexuals you just... get a bad rap. They just get a fucking bad rap. They just get blamed. <laughs> Make up your mind. And then now it's like, if you're a survivor, it's just the perfect time to just pick one person who's going to love you 
and just stick with that person. Right, like, why are right. you being so selfish as to want to have another person? That's really sold also as a healing narrative is yeah, that, yeah, oh, yeah. oh shit, like you're a survivor, but don't worry, your true love will come along or you'll find them and then after you settle down and you you know do the thing with them then it'll be just fine it's not to put down people who also want to choose monogamy want love for you know it's just a a whole spectrum of the ways in which we have sex love and want to meet with people that that's the point that we are we are not one dimensional once you know we are seen as a survivor there's this limited like kind of view vision of what that survivorship looks like, Mm -hmm. which that's what we don't want. Right. We want it to Mm -hmm. look a little different because that's exactly what it is. It's expansive and how people are. Right. Jeez. I've been asked that the reason for being queer trans is because I have suffered in my childhood from sexual abuse. Very interesting connection there. And I just, or like my interest in kink is like, you know, maybe if you healed a little more, then you yeah. wouldn't be queer and kinky and trans. Go, go do your healing and then see what happens. I bet you you fall back onto your default, which is a straight vanilla cis person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like quite the opposite, I think, for me. is like, for me, kink is the, the, the healing medicine for me, the modality that I've used the most in feeling centered and good and working through my shit it's like the be- the most empowering place that I feel, mm-hmm. right? But to, for people to see it as a negative, and I think it's mostly because people don't understand. They don't understand. Yeah. I, I don't know. I say this a lot. That's like, I was kinky <laughs> before I was anything else. Yeah. I was, I, I think, and by that I mean, I mean really expanding, eroticizing trauma. Like before I had any idea what sex was, before I had any idea what desire was, any of that, I was aware of how my body was a site of violence. I was mm-hmm. aware of how I could be violated. So some of my earlier erotic memories are that of what I consider like kinky fantasies, because mm. that was the way I could cope with that awareness that my body could yeah. be the side of violence so it's like i by eroticizing it that would help me with my fear a little bit mm-hmm. the person who abused me my f- first relationship as an adult it was a kinky relationship it was not well negotiated of course because this person was an abuser the line between kink and abuse was extremely blurry in this relationship yeah. but there were also t- at times at which uh I, I learned a lot. I, I really enjoyed a lot of the things. But when I have shared that story of like, I've had an abuser who engaged in kinky sex with me, who also sexually assaulted me continuously. And now I currently also am someone who's kinky. It's like, oh, oh, now, again, that now right. makes sense. Right. Okay, <laughs> like, that's right. Like you started fucking with kink stuff. So I like, guess that's how like, yes, you're trying to right. resolve your trauma. Yeah, no shit. First of all, like we lived in a world where there was zero sexual violence, gender violence, fucked up shit. Right. Maybe kink wouldn't be a thing. Maybe we would all just like, I don't know, like sit around and breathe together and come. I don't know. <laughs> I love that. I, I don't know what this <laughs> ideal is like trying to pinpoint that, you know, any interest in kink BDSM or deviant sexual desire right. is has some fucked up root. I'm like, what does it have a fucked up root? Right, Why right. should I give up something that I'm currently finding healing and helpful to me because they think the, the kink and BDSM practices by themselves inherently are mm-hmm. problematic. We both talk about using kink as a like a healing modality that it's been good for us. The funny thing is that people don't talk about this, but it is exactly the same the other side around. People use love and relationships in a non-consensual healing modality. People have their own story and then they are looking for whatever. I'm looking for a husband, I'm looking for a mate, I'm looking for this and I want this in that person. How many times have people been in a relationship, that person isn't that, but they try to make that person that, mm-hmm. right? They, it's like non-consensual because I, I'm going to shape this to fit what feels good to me because it's addressing my trauma. Whether you were abandoned as a child, whether your parents didn't pay attention to you, whether you were sexually abused, like all of these, any kind of trauma, a lot of us do try to do that through 
emotions, through emotions, through yes. love, through having someone take care of us. This isn't something weird we're saying that I use kink as a healing modality. Y'all motherfuckers use that too all the time. Yes. Yeah, using those as healing modalities is good. One is definitely negotiated and talked about mm -hmm. and one isn't. People do not even apply the principles of consent and negotiation and accountability to relationships and love. Uh, at least in kink BDSM community, if they're doing it right, those ideas are still present and have been worked on for so many decades. It's like there's mm -hmm. so much on it you can build on. Right. But within love relationship, it's just like, nah, you know, if it's the right, if it's right, it's, it's, a, it's magic. It'll just work out. It just doesn't so, serve anybody with, the, with that fantasy thing rather than the understanding your own feelings, figuring out what you want, naming those things and going after them. That shit is hard. The, what I just named, many people do not know how to do that because we're not taught that. No. We're just not. Mm -mm. We're taught that good relationships happen when you meet a good person. Yeah. We are not told the truth, which is that good relationships happen when you reach a level of growth that you can select the right person that you can grow together with. Instead of, so instead of turning the thing inward and be like, okay, what, what can I do on myself so that I can, I can engage healthily with others? No, 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 you just, you stay the way you are. Just look for the good person that comes along and just deals with your shit as is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true, yeah. And the subject of perverts and sexually broken survivors who like sex too much, I'm thinking about watching porn. Also, just being in porn, you know, being in porn, mm -hmm. being a sex worker, but yeah. also watching porn. I personally directly make a connection between finding porn also very healing. I have absolutely engaged in watching too much porn. And I, I, de I define that as when like, it's, it, the behavior itself has been harmful to me. First of all, if you're not a straight dude and you watch porn a lot, it's like what's going on there with you? Like, why? <laughs> <laughs> if you are a cis straight dude, there's some room for you to watch some porn, maybe when you're single, but not after. It's yeah, just, it's hard like, to find a mate that is okay with like you watching porn. <laughs> I, I love porn. I love it. Um, there is a particular kind of porn that I like, and that is I love the um, role play stuff. I like the, the aggressive um, stuff, the fantasy rape play. I love it. I love it. And for a while, I was just like, what's wrong with me? Is, is something wrong with me because I, I'm watching this? Is this because? And I really had to sit with myself and be like, number one, am I doing this to excess? No. Am I hurting someone? No. Am I having orgasms that are blowing my mind? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I just started asking myself yeah. a lot of questions and I was like, no, it's not harming me. It's actually mm -hmm. having me, I'm releasing, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just keep checking in with myself about it. And I've been in porn too, you know? So it's like, actually for me, it's been the opposite um, of people thinking people in porn are broken. For me, mm -hmm. going into porn was specifically about my healing, about feeling for the first time in my life that I loved looking at my body naked, that somebody found me desirable, that I can say what I want and negotiate it and that people want to actually see it. And like all of the things, I was like, this is my sexual liberation moment. Like being in porn was so much fun for me. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. And I mm -hmm. had a really great experience. You know, I don't know if a lot of people can say that. Uh, I don't know, because yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, people, uh, people that I've known have had great experience in porn and stuff. And it was an elevating experience for me. Not a bad one at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and when people want to see it that way, it just, it just like takes away from the beauty of it for me. Then I was like, I got to that place. I got to that place that um, it was about what I wanted. It, it reminds me of my own, I guess, journey of what I've projected into porn stars over the years uh, from, from, you know, the voyeur point of view. Because when I remember when I first started really getting into watching porn, and I also like, I generally speaking, really liked the rough, rougher, rougher kinds of porn. I, I'm not mm -hmm. a soft core <laughs> porn watcher. Yeah. I, of course, had a lot of shame around it and had mm -hmm. a lot of questions around what was it saying about me? Why was I interested in this type of porn? a lot of projecting onto the porn mm -hmm. star and definitely I was projecting my own shame around uh, my own sexuality and my own just being my own body yeah. into specifically the female porn stars 
so it started from a place of like, oh yes, you are. Oh look at like, gosh, fuck, I was a young feminist. I was like, so mm-hmm. fucked up. <laughs> oh my gosh like with my vibrator in my hand so <laughs> fucked up <laughs> wait i'm about to come <laughs> <laughs> it was, in, a, like, in a way the fucked upness i think was the thing that was pushing me to the edge if there was no patriarchy i don't think i would have find it as attractive <laughs> <laughs> so you know it started from that place of really looking down and be like oh man like this is so bad like you know a poor poor porn star has to do mm-hmm. these things, you know, right, these men right. doing these things. And then over the years, I've come to a place, I really reached this place where I was like, I envy the porn star. I look at it yeah. and I'm like, <laughs> oh my gosh, look at you being so fucking liberated with your body. <laughs> yes, yes. You're doing it. I'm like, this is it. Like, you have arrived. You mm-hmm. have arrived to a place the rest of us envy going from projecting the sexually brokenness into them right, right. to like really seeing. I'm like, no. And again, these are not, these are my projections, as you're saying. Right, right, right. Not every porn star is having a liberating <laughs> healing moment and not every porn star is sexually broken. It's just like any other job and performance. A lot of people with different experiences engage in it. Porn and just like any kind of body art where you can be free with all sorts of sexual erotic expression of your body, mm-hmm. how that itself is such a powerful form of healing, especially in a society that particularly looks at you as someone who does porn as broken. I am a sex worker. I do sex surrogate work. I have done um, phone acting work and I was for a long time a professional escort booker and better for their clients. I don't think it had anything to do with me being a survivor. I think I was made for this. Like, I think I was born into this body to do this kind of work. I use sex to address trauma for myself and for my clients and for my friends. It works. I think it's important not to let sex turn into something like reckless usage of drugs and alcohol. But I don't really believe in a sex addiction. I believe people are addicted to their traumas and they may use sex as a band-aid for that. I also have also done sex work. Um, and as a trans person, I feel like it's more related to being trans than it is related to um, being a person who is a survivor. Sometimes it goes hand in hand, you know, uh, the statistic for designated male at birth gender non-conforming children is they're nine times more likely to actually experience uh, child sexual assault uh, because of the lack of um, just affirmations around their gender, but also, yeah, the lack of protections being kicked out um, of their home and everything. I I definitely did uh, participate in sex work um, at times. I think that what's what's really interesting is how other people deny the kind of agency to sex workers to do that kind of work in in ways that are actually consensual and in ways that describe their own experiences as like lucrative or um fulfilling or even medicine you know i've i've actually done sex work where i've i have like felt great afterwards because like hey I have money and I had great sex like what more (laughs) can anyone want for so long in my early sexual history sex was escape um for me you know it was the way that I didn't have to for however long the sex was happening which is why I'm terrible at quickies I didn't have to think about (laughs) Whatever the fuck else was going on in my life, right? <laughs> like, I was like, great, we're here for two hours. For two hours, I'm not thinking about where I'm going to eat, sleep, you know, what I have to do for work, how to fit into whiteness so that I can make sure that I can get the thing that I need to be able to do the thing. You know, like, I don't have to think about any of that. So I was like, great, let's get good at the sex thing so that people don't even act ask about any sort of survivorship because there's no way you're doing this and doing that and being a survivor. The magic from being able to be in that escapism is now it is a place for healing, not just for me, but hopefully for the people who I'm in partnership with sexually, right? Where there is a whole other level of conversation, right? I don't have sex with anyone without talking about 
survivor statuses. I just don't. Now, whether that person chooses to tell me or not is up to them, but I'm going to reveal mine. I'm going to disclose. I'm also going to ask. Right, and you can be in choice about whether you not you want to give me that information. You know, looking at that porn, that kind of rough porn and stuff, and people usually also connecting that particular porn to brokenness and stuff. Like many people that have uh, experienced trauma, whether it was sexual, physical, and stuff, and talking about how people have intentionally recreated their trauma to help mm. them get past it. We have people that unintentionally or unconsciously do it all the time. We do recreate our trauma. It is mm -hmm. absolutely a fact. It's going to happen one way or another, right? And mm -hmm. unconsciously, we keep on repeating patterns that might harm us or might harm others and stuff. This thing harmed me, and I'm terrified of this thing all the time. And so I'm going to use the thing that scared the shit out of me, and I'm going to use it. And it works like that's why that porn like really like speaks to me and that's what i look for and i don't question it anymore it is there for me to it is there <laughs> it's like obviously yeah. there's many people that like this kind of uh porn and it right. is there to be consumed and to be made and um yes and, and there's a different conversation that could be had about the politics of viewership the politics of porn industry and all right, of that right, right right but that's not like that's not within the scope of your interest in porn and whether or not you watch a, a particular porn excluded certain types of porn which are not really porn anymore so just violent film can we can we just be done with the stigma can we just be done with right. pathologizing and can we just be done with projecting the shame and the fear and the, the things that our own brokenness into the right. people who do porn and the people who watch porn. It is almost inherently believed that cis men or men are supposed to like sex. Yes. So right. they can never be in the category of liking sex too much. Oh, maybe. I'm, I'm, maybe not. Because I know that there are people who, when we're talking about the porn stuff, yeah. um, I've heard people say people are addicted. You know? Well, it's only for, for cis men who are partnered. Cis oh, men yes, who are yes, partnered, yes. they're not, they're suddenly supposed to, so like before they're partnered, there's no such a thing as liking sex too much. Like that's just their nature, of course. Yeah, yeah. So like there's no upper limit to how much, what they could do with their sexuality that could be deemed problematic. But, but once they're partnered, then things are different now. Then they're supposed to right. suddenly uh, direct all of that interest and desire and all that motivation and encouragement to fuck mm -hmm. and like and like sex. Right into that one partner mm -hmm. and not watch porn, not masturbate, not seek other partners, nothing, right? Just that's it. <laughs> the single cis guys who, like anybody else, could be survivors, could be engaging in mm -hmm. having sex, watching porn, whatever, in a way that is harming to them in behavior that can be excessive like that, mm -hmm. then it goes unnoticed, right? It goes like we over pathologize non-cis men for their interest in sex and we under pathologize cis men for any interest in sex cherry on top is that then we also inherently deem men's sexuality as harmful and something that they need to harness and like put a leash yes. on it and and make sure they don't harm anyone with it like inherently mm -hmm. and then also we accept it because we accept it so much as harmful we don't really hold them accountable for it we just watch out for it yeah we don't really think there's anything that can be done about it we just think it's inherently harmful mm -hmm. and the rest of us need to just really watch out yeah and it really just fucks them over on on so many levels because it's like if the person is a survivor a cis guy is a survivor and not having that sex that they're supposed to be because god mm -hmm. you're, you're a guy testosterone come on you're supposed to be having all this sex right if they're not they don't fit that narrative and then they can be deemed broken as well. Like what's wrong right. with you? Because you don't fit right. the, the narrative, right? And then on the other side, it's like as a survivor, if they're having too much sex then, uh, or you know, if it's deemed too much sex, nobody ever considers that the too much mm -hmm. sex mm -hmm. is about trauma. It's only seen as it's just what it is. And right. then it, you miss an opportunity there when there needs to be help when somebody needs to reach out because if you say put it on the other side we're talking about binaries here uh mm -hmm. if a cis woman was having lots and lots and lots of sex and you know just uh not 
caring what people think because mostly mm -hmm. sometimes guys are like that they're like this is my nature and i could have sex mm -hmm. and people talk about that and there is a problem with that there is an inherent problem with a woman being too sexual or just sexual and and like uh very free about it this is the fucked up thing about it how patriarchy and all this shit fucks with everybody that when you are a cis guy who maybe doesn't have that much sex because of the trauma a lot of times you're either seen as a faggot or you're seen as a wimpy guy you know mm. like just not a real man like what is wrong with you so even manhood manhood is definitely connected to the things that men are supposed to, you know like this thing that men are supposed to do and if you don't do it right. something is wrong with your manhood right and that's another category that's very pathologized being asexual and connected to survivorship right it's like if you're mm -hmm. asexual if you're gray sexual, if, if, you, if just your interest, your desire, your drive for sex is too little, on the flip side of this is like the, gen, the, the gender aspect to it. If you are an asexual who is a cis man, you're just a beta male. Mm, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if uh, you're not a cis man and you're asexual uh, or you don't want sex so much or don't have as much desire for it, then you also might be, you know, it's because you may have suffered trauma sexual trauma and that's why which again is is the truth of the case for a lot of people um not for everybody mm -hmm. and maybe connected and the same thing with liking sex too much or too little it's like of course it's a piece of this puzzle of this complicated mm -hmm. puzzle of our sexuality and desire but it's not everything and it's not like that for everyone my relationships center intimacy and vulnerability and i'm willing to be in the conversation about what kind of relationship we're in over a period of time i'm like okay now we're friends this is platonic now we maybe are feeling sexual attraction to each other do we want to do anything about that um and i feel like a lot of it being in a very big survivor community, you know, it could feel like that is an affront. Actually, a part of deeply reclaiming in my sexuality has been reclaiming the ability to be like, at any point, I could feel sexually attracted to someone in my life. At any point, giving myself permission, it doesn't mean I'm going to act on it or even bring it up. But like, it is okay that at any point, somebody who who is not a family member, somebody who is not a child of mine, would fall into a space of sexual attraction. I was really aware of structural violence when I came into my relationships with my lovers. And I'm thinking about my kink and how that has played out with two different lovers I had, both masculine or center, both people of color. I feel like the ways that this has played out is hardly ever talked about, <laughs> super stigmatized. But we, we didn't do race play specifically, right? But what we did was, um, I was a bottom. I was a, you know, intense masochist in one relationship and an intense submissive in the other. And the, you know, the veiled or unspoken thing is both of these masculine of center, butch, you know, trans spectrum, folks of color, were getting so much shit every day out there. I mean, so much aggression in the culture. One of them was very tiny. And so also like, you know, this, you know, total badass and because of their stature, getting all this shit and feminized and everything. And so I felt like as a white femme masochist for them, I was like, come on, baby, give it all to me. You know, all that shit you're taking on out there, I can hold all of it for you. And so people will be like, oh my God, you have all this white guilt in your sexuality. No, that's not white guilt. No, nope. that's about like creating a space of transformation for your lover because you can see the shit that's there. And so I have no shame about that. I feel like a badass about it. You know, I read famous books by doctors who purport to study CSA survivors and whatever. And they're talking about like the hypersexuality of of survivors or whatever which is like who is measuring this and who decides what hyper is exactly and also why is it only ever women and femmes and girls that they're talking about who's like why are you so worried about how much sex lovers are having anyway sex like wanting it or not wanting it is seen as like a symptom of the trauma we endured which 
in and of itself just like completely erases the agency of any of us choosing to have sex or choosing to not have sex because it's like no this decision didn't come from within me it came from something that happened to me that I had no control over right like it came from there not from like actually any real desire to have or not have sex which is like an extremely shitty way for us to think about sexuality and survivorship for me my struggle has been to like hold two truths together at the same time, which is like my sexuality and sex is an expression of myself and my healing. And at the same time, and like not a symptom of my trauma. And at the same time, like my trauma invariably impacts my sexuality and my desire to have sex. And I have gone through extended periods of time of choosing not to have sex. And it felt like very empowering and very healing what doesn't feel healing is like when I don't feel like I have control over it. And I think it's really difficult, you know, to go through periods of time where I feel like almost like this CSA is winning because I want to want sex and it's so difficult for me to feel safe and, and like enthusiastic about it. Survivors are trapped because either we like want too much sex or we want too little of it. And it's all seen in the context of being like a problem and not just like the fact that sexuality, our bodies, our relationships to them, our relationships to our mental health, all of these things like ebb and flow throughout our lives and like aren't necessarily like stagnant things. Sex is a really fast way for us to stigmatize survivors and the way that they survive and the way that they heal and a fast way for us to be like, oh, you, you had this thing that you had that you went through, but don't express your trauma. And at the same time, everything you're doing is an expression of your trauma. And it's just like, it's just another trap. People with disabilities are not supposed to be sexual. They're not sexual right. beings. You know, like nobody's thinking about sex, right? <laughs> Which right, is bullshit, right. right? And so if someone with a disability was having mm-hmm. a little, you know, not too much sex, then it would just go over because it's like we're wrapped up in our idea of what these people are supposed to do, supposed to be, supposed to behave. And then we right. don't think that there could be other things going on, especially right. with sex, because like sex and disability, what? Like people never want to put those things together. Maybe instead of focusing on how much sex someone is having, or drawing conclusions from how much sex they're having, what type of sex they're having, what kind of relationships they're engaged in, if they're queer, if they're ace, if they're trans, like you don't <laughs> need to psychoanalyze every sexual behavior you see, <laughs> yes. right? First, first of all. Um, and second of all, it's like, that isn't, even if you are going to like, I don't know if it's your job or something, it's, it's not, it's not about the, it's not about the extra, I mean, it's, it's our job, but like, it's not about the, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's not the, extra, it's not what you see. It's like, how is that person connecting with the behavior? What does that behavior signify for that person? You mm-hmm. could be having all the sex in the world every single day, and that could be the most amazing, fulfilling experience that just gives your life meaning and fulfillment. Mm-hmm. And you could be on the outside, another person could be engaging in the same frequency of sex, same type of sex, but doing it in a way that is really destructive to themselves and other people. Right. Right. Yeah. It's like you cannot really make any judgment about what's going on with the person from the type of sex or the frequency, the, the amount of sex they're having, whether it's Absolutely. too little, too much or whatever. I don't even know what normal amount of sex is. Like, what I is don't either. What, like, <laughs> what, what do heads is like straight, whatever, <laughs> white vanilla people do? Like they have a schedule like twice a week at this time we fuck. <laughs> what is that (laughs) yeah i really don't know i wonder if there's like data out there that says this is the normal amount of you know sex that people should be having i'm I'm sure there's like averages about it but yeah it's like the whole issue of like is the average what we're striving for (laughs) but the average is probably based on couples or or self-reporting which often it's it has lie. complications of like what people <laughs> consider sex, what do people yeah. think? Like it's just like complicated, yeah. complicated. I remember one time someone was telling me a story about a little neighborhood girl or something like that. She 
wasn't leaving the house. You know, her mother was telling her, you know, go outside, get outside. It's hot outside. And she just wouldn't leave the house. Um, the person telling me the story was, is, you know, be it's because, you know, those, all these guys are sniffing around her, you know, like she's just a little hotness. She's just a hot to trot little girl that's always having sex with guys. And so um, I think she's just had a little too much. So she's taking a break. And th the way that they were talking about it now, this girl was 15. And it always makes me think about, again, the perception of someone. And this happens a lot to girls of color. That girl is so hot. She is out there having sex with this one and flirting and flirting with older men. And what do they do? They always blame it on the young person or something. You know, mm. they always blame it. And when I see that, that is a point of conversation or inquiry, right? Because when it's a young person, um, you want to make sure that there's no foul play, that there's nothing going on. Are they acting out? Are they doing something? But most people just dismiss it mm -hmm. as she's a whore. Mm -hmm. And that's real simple. Yeah. It's simple to say a, a, a young girl is being a whore. Right. Rather than talking about the fucking 35-year-old men that are coming to sniff out at her, you know, like coming over to want to have sex with her. Nobody talks about those, but they talk mm -hmm. about her. She needs somebody to listen to her and she needs those, you know, grown ass men to leave her the hell alone. Right. Like somebody needs to talk to, right. to them. It really is this complete disconnection and understanding that we have around holistic sex and like just what taking sex out of the context of just fucking dick and pussy fucking, you know, and making babies. It is about a connection, a mm -hmm. connection to another person that could be sexual, that could be something else. But our ability to fucking communicate and connect on a level with other people mm -hmm. is just so not there. And right. fear, we're afraid of all of the things that we don't know. So, you know, porn, BDSM, kink, you know, mm -hmm. we make a lot of assumptions about those things rather than like just learning maybe. Hmm, that's an idea, learning. <laughs> <laughs> So, for this episode, we are interested in hearing your experiences, your stories of ever being told that a sexual desire, interest, behavior that you've had is, you know, inherently bad or wrong, or that you should look deeper into it or figure it out because you're a survivor, you know? Tell us you know, how it made you feel, uh, what happened. What do you think about it? Do you think they were right? Do you think that, uh, you know, it had nothing to do with it? Maybe something to do with it? And make sure you use hashtags caution series, hashtag bad survivors, of course, hashtag heal to end, and hashtag survivors who like sex too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, um, I want you to subscribe on YouTube, hit the bell and thumbs up. Thanks everybody.